Hi everyone, so today I'm with Naomi McDougall Jones, the writer and star of Bite Me the Movie, and Christian Coulson, her co-star, who you'll recognise as Tom Riddle in Harry Potter and Chamber of Secrets. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's really lovely to meet you both. Nice. Thanks for having us. Hello. <laughs> Can I speak? Yes, now. Hello. So for those who don't know already, Bite Me is a new subversive romantic comedy about a real life subculture of people who believe that they're vampires and the IRS agent, played by Christian, who is assigned with the task of auditing them. So Naomi plays Sarah, who is one of the vampires, and yeah, Christian plays James, the IRS agent. Um, and the story follows them as they develop something of a pretty complex relationship I would say. <laughs> so I saw the film yesterday and I absolutely loved it. Um, it's a really still good movie. I mean, it's a really great achievement of being like subtle for such an out there concept, I think. But uh, yeah, what was the process of researching and creating this, Naomi? Like what made you so interested in real life vampires and this whole subculture? Yeah. Um, well, I actually met the way I didn't know about this subculture. And then I was acting on Boardwalk Empire and got chatting with a background actor one day who revealed to me over the course of a 16 hour shoot day that she was a vampire. And I was like, what? Uh, and then because I'm a writer, I was like, okay, tell me everything. And um, she explained to me that there is this actual subculture of people who identify as vampires. And so um, I spent about two years as I was writing it, researching them and reading books by and about them and watching their vlogs on YouTube, of which there are many. And, uh, and just, um, I try, just became completely captivated by them. And the, the initial impulse behind writing the movie, aside from the fact that I just love romantic comedies so much, um, was the experience of, be, of being a very strange child myself and growing up watching all these Hollywood movies about supposed weirdos and outsiders and just like like the Princess Diaries with Anne Hathaway and just always feeling like yeah but she still looks like Anne Hathaway you know like she's not she, you gave her braces and frizzy hair but she's not an actual weirdo you know like you can't make her a weirdo she's Anne Hathaway um and so 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 my initial impulse behind the movie was wanting to make a film for the real weirdos of the world. And also, um, unlike in those other movies, a movie where the girl gets to keep her glasses on at the end, you know, that it isn't like she gets a makeover and then finally he sees through to her winning personality. It's like she is who she is and he eventually falls in love with that person. Um, so so then when I, when I found out about the vampires, I thought that was such a, a fascinating way into that story because here's this group of people who choose i mean they 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 are born with this this need and this desire but but to choose to act on it and choose to live your their truth in that way um is astonishing to me because it you know many of them get disowned by their families um it, it really pushes you to the edge of society and and to believe in in something that much and to live that way i found kind of inspiring in a in an interesting way yeah. Oh, and Christian, how did you come on board? What was your thoughts, sort of first thoughts on the whole premise of the film? Did you learn a lot about like the real story behind this, and how well, did you sort of relate to it? When I first read it, um, I didn't know anything about it at all, and uh, I was sent the script and um, read it, and was just like, oh, I really love this. I love this story. I really like the way it's being told, and um, this was like something I wanted to be involved in, and then. Uh, uh, I went and met up with Naomi, I was in the middle of um, rehearsals and uh, went to lunch to meet up with Naomi and talk about it and it just was so... Uh, Naomi's um, whole, uh, I would say even more than the script, which I had loved, like her whole um, approach to life and to filmmaking and to like just the excitement and um, and like hunger to tell the story and the way in which she then like told me the story of where it had come from and the information, it was just so, um, I just knew that like, that like working with her was something I wanted to be doing. That this was like, this was like a, it felt holistically like the right project to be doing. And, um, and you know, I trusted her and like her um, 
enthusiasm was so infectious for it too to be like oh this this uh, extraordinary woman is going to put together this like difficult story uh you know no, i mean not that the story is difficult but like just logistically making a movie is so hard and then um like i she was just so um she's like a force a real force <laughs> of, of light and nature That's so nice to hear and tell us a bit more about the tour i mean one of the things that i really loved um i think i've read in the tour that you were filming it and sort of processing the entire journey of making an independent film as well which obviously to filmmakers out there aspiring filmmakers that's something that everyone wants to see and just getting that like honesty um, and transparency I think it's really important so yeah can you tell us a little bit more about how it's going and where yeah. you're at right now yeah so the tour um as Christian said making a movie in the first place is basically an impossible task like it should never work it's an insane art form the number of pieces that have to come together the amount of money you need to raise just sort of the whole thing it's like it should never happen and yet it does all the time um so i think what what frequently happens is when you get to the end of the marathon of actually making the movie everybody is so dead that you're just like whatever just somebody take it um and so i don't think enough um attention is put on what happens to the movies then and what we discovered, so my first feature film, Imagine I'm Beautiful, did get a theatrical release through a traditional distributor and my producing partner, Sarah Wharton's had as well. And, and those experiences had been really disappointing, honestly. Like it felt like we had won the, the thing that everybody thinks they want to get, which is you know being chosen by a distributor. And then the, the outcome was really disappointing both financially and from, um, sorry, there's a fly who is, <laughs> decided that this is his time to be in the interview. Um, uh, but disappointing financially and also from an experiential perspective because what's happening as a result of streaming and Netflix and um, uh, declining theater ticket sales is that distributors are now just acquiring masses of independent film content and essentially dumping it into the marketplace with no marketing dollars and strategy behind it. And so what happens is that we just get lost into the abyss of iTunes and Amazon and Netflix. And it's terrible for us because nobody watches our movies or, or, and our investors don't make their own money back. And it's actually also bad for audiences because as Hollywood moves further and further into this theme park uh, sequelization of movie making and away from storytelling, um, independent film has this really important role to play now more than ever in terms of providing those fresh and original and important stories that we all need. But the problem is that because they aren't being marketed effectively, um, audiences don't know how to find them. So audiences are always coming up to me and saying like, like, why don't they make good movies anymore? And I'm like, we are making them, you don't know how to find them. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so when it came time to release this film and we had a final cut and it was so good and we tested it with audiences and people just loved it and they laughed. Like it was just like the movie had accomplished everything we wanted it to as a movie. And we just like, we just didn't want to just throw it off a cliff again. Um, yeah. And so uh, my producing partner and I, Sarah Wharton, we're like, okay, what if we just didn't get a distributor? And distributors, by the way, take up to 95% of all revenue from, every, from films, um, which is Ooh. bananas. <laughs> um, so like, you can't make any money on that model because they're taking all of the money. Um, so we are like, so what if we just got in an RV and drove around the country and took the film to the audience that we know is there? Um, and we just started calling theaters and pitching them this idea and saying, okay, it's hard to get people to leave their houses for just a movie. But what if we were there at every screening? So instead of just asking them to come see a movie, you get to meet the filmmaker, you get to have a Q&A, talk about the film afterwards. And then what if we threw a joyful vampire ball after every screening? So we're asking people to come in costume and come to a screening, meet the filmmaker and go to a party. That suddenly becomes a more promising proposition to get to them to leave their houses. So that's what we did. And we actually had so many theaters say yes that we had to cap it at, a, at 51 screenings because we physically couldn't do more than that in 90 days without dying. Um, and so uh, that became the Joyful Vampire Tour of America, which we are in the middle of. And um, so we just had our 30th screening last night, which is in, was in San Francisco and it sold out. And it's just been 
uh, totally magical. And, and the film is available online at the same time, because of course, if we're only in every place one night, not everybody's gonna be able to come have that in-person experience, but we want them to be able to watch the movie right away. Um, and then yes, as you said, because we're on this insane adventure journey of living in an RV, uh, and also because we, we really are trying to pioneer a new distribution model that would empower filmmakers and audiences to find one another without these middlemen. Um, and so what we're doing is we're, we're offering ourselves as a radically transparent case study um, for other filmmakers. So we're being completely transparent with our numbers, where we're spending money, where we're making money, what our, what our strategy is, what, our mark, what we're doing on marketing. So by the end of the tour, and so every, every Saturday throughout the tour, Kiwi Callahan, a filmmaker who is also living in this RV with us, is releasing a 10 to 20 minute episode about the tour and about the whole thing. Um, so by the end of the tour, there will be a full blueprint of what we've done. So if, if we're wildly successful, other filmmakers can replicate it. And if we're not, they can at least have the information and do it better than we did if it doesn't work for us. Um, and what's really exciting is that, um, so the first six episodes are out and we just have been contacted by a number of filmmakers who said, we're so inspired by, the, by how transparent you're being that our films got traditional theatrical distribution deals and we will now come on your series and t and reveal our numbers um, as well so, cool. <laughs> so we now have like five other filmmakers who are who we've begun interviewing and the stories about the distribution deals are insane um, so anyway so it's so now it's becoming this and we're we're gonna go try to go to the press with it once we have some more stories because yeah. film, I mean what is happening within the distribution world is downright fraudulent um, and and like mobster level uh, business practices. So, so yeah, so now it's sort of turning into this whole other thing that's, that feels really exciting. That's so cool. Yeah. It sounds like it was always meant to go that way as well. Like maybe you didn't expect it to go that way, but it's, it's got that sort of community and like people are rallying behind it. So yeah. how different is this Christian for you to like see this happening? Did you sort of expect this to happen when you came into the project? Cause... Um, well, every time you make a movie, you just don't, I mean, unless it's like a, unless it's like a, a you know, a major studio picture, you just don't know. It's, I've made stuff that people see and I've made stuff that like vanishes and other things that like win awards. It's like, it's just like a, it's a total uh, crapshoot in that way. Um, so I had no idea, like, um, the, uh, you know, the question about distribution is so far from your mind at the, at the beginning, and particularly as a performer, it's so out of my control. So, um, so it's been incredibly, uh, it's been a big learning experience for me. It's also interesting that we're talking about this today because the Times, the New York Times had, um, I don't know if you saw this name, this big article today interviewing all these different filmmakers who are basically saying yeah. that the, the model is changing not just not just by the year but by the month at the moment because nobody knows how to, uh, you know, in, at this moment in time where people under the age of 25 are not watching movies, where getting people to the theatre more than four times a year is almost impossible, uh, no one knows how to make money with movies anymore. And so... Um, it's not just uh, us that's asking the question. This is like being asked at every level of the um, industry. And I think it's tremendously exciting that, that uh, Nanny and Sarah found a way to, um, you know, to really go out there and speak to also the fact that we're, we're so like, um, we're so like isolated uh, in our experiences of culture at the moment, you know, binge watching TV at different times and like catching up with each other about it sometime in the next few months, but like rarely sitting down, with the, with the rare exception of say Game of Thrones, rarely sitting down to like watch something together. Um, it's just really thrilling to have a, an opportunity to take something out there and invite people in um, to experience it as, uh, communally because that's so much, um, it's funny, a lot, of the, a lot of the things that people were saying in this article were about like spectacle and about, um, and about theatricality, but I, I think there's also this huge missing aspect in terms of their mindset, which is that um, the experience, there are movies I have seen that are not particularly theatrical, but the experience of watching them with other people altered, completely altered the way the material landed. And obviously 
we do this with comedy most, uh, you know, most easily because when you sit in a room, people laughing, it's completely different than sitting alone at home. But actually, intense emotional experiences are also vastly different when you're in a room with hundreds of people than they are uh, alone at home. So um, I don't think it is just about like the loudest, biggest thing you can get on a screen. It's um, it's it's also just that that experiencing things to you know we, as a theatre performer as well we just know this it's like experiencing things together is a very different thing than watching them uh, alone totally and and I, I also read that times article and i had the same thought because like they've decided that okay the only response to this must be spectacle which is an indie filmmaker if that's true then we're just totally screwed because we can't out spectacle hollywood <laughs> like we just that's not a thing we can do but but the experience of being with these people um, in community and what you say is so right, we're so starved for that. Like it, the hurdle to get us to leave our houses is so much higher, but once you get people over that hurdle, they are just desperate to like be with each other. And um, one of the things we do uh, with the parties is I do this sort of it is a ritual, but that's not as weird as it sounds. It's not like culty or anything, but, it, but basically I just say to people like, because the whole theme of the movie is about accepting outsiders and accepting ourselves yeah. as we are and coming as we are and all these things. So I sort of do this little thing where I say basically like, why don't we just try a radical experiment tonight and just see if we can create that space for each other tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and like, like see if you can show up fully as yourself and try to meet people fully as themselves and like just let's practice radical kindness for an evening um which is a very simple thing but the we have had people just sob when i say that and then we go to the party and you witness strangers having these deep and night-long conversations with each other and just like the i can't describe the feelings in those rooms it's so warm and excited and happy and just like we just meet each other again and i and i do think that art and film can be a way to do that, but you have to you have to figure out how to get people to to come and leave their houses. And what's mm -hmm. lovely about By Me is that it's um, it's like not only is the experience of sharing the movie that, that Sarah and Naomi put together doing this, but the movie is about this. So it's like um, right. it's this extremely sort of like confluence of uh, a theme and uh, and then the way in which we're sharing it with people. Um, mm -hmm. It like it speaks. It's, this is what it's about. It's about like isolated communities and people realizing they're part of some thing in the, in this romantic comedy. Yeah, yeah, I love it. It sounds like a Harry Potter convention. That sounds perfect. <laughs> yes. No, I think this is true though. I think like spaces where weirdos, like there's a line in the movie that um, that Christian has where he says uh, he goes to a vampire ball for the first time and he's sort of this normal dude or seemingly normal dude and he's in this suddenly in this room full of, of vampires and he says oh my god I've just realized there's nothing I could do that would make me the weirdest person here and to yeah. me that is what the movie is and I think in spaces like Harry Potter conventions or where all of these people who are always outside like suddenly you can't be the most outside person anymore are so beautiful. And I think that's sort of the space that we've been able to create for people um, night after night, which is so yeah. nice. Yeah. I love that. I mean, any film about like community subcultures, I'm there, I'm summing up. <laughs> <laughs> I know in the film as well, the little nod to muggle, there was a little line. Um, yeah. Where like, oh, you mean like a muggle or something yeah. like that? I loved it. Was that, that was clearly your idea. <laughs> Well, it, no, actually, then. that line was in there before Christian, before we oh. cast Christian, because I'm a Harry Potter nerd, and I just thought it was funny. Yes. But uh, but then it was funnier because Christian said it. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciated that. Yeah. <laughs> what are both your houses, your Hogwarts houses? I don't know if you both know them, but uh, I'm a Slytherin. I'm Gryffindor. Right. Wait, nice. Cool. Wait, what are you, Nami? I'm Gryffindor. Oh, yeah. And I just we found out, selection here. Oh, I'm a Ravenclaw. Raven you're a Ravenclaw. This fly is so determined to be in this interview. Um, Thank God there's no Hufflepuffs because like, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, Christian would leave. Um, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I just I just did my Patronus test on the tour actually on Pottermore, and I got an oh. uh, an owl. An oh, owl. It's a pretty yeah. good one. Yeah, what I feel like mean? that's a pretty good one. What? What does it mean? 
Um, well, they don't like, really like, tell you. Like, like, what is that? Yeah, you have to look it up. Shrewdness mean. You mean what? Well, what difference does it make? What animal? Like, um, like then what? Well, then I don't know. I just started researching owls then and found out that they're really awesome. <laughs> have you seen <laughs> them without their feathers? No. Oh, it's worth. Well, that sounds horrible. <laughs> I yeah, know, owl, the, the most amazing, just Google image or search engine of your choice, uh, owls without feathers. Oh. I just insert an image of an owl without a feather. <laughs> they don't look like owls. I don't think, I, I feel like that's one of those things I'll never be able to unsee. It's not that awful, it's great. <laughs> it's like a little chicken, oh no. <laughs> oh no, I'm not looking it up, I don't want to know. <laughs> I was going to say that James seems like a Hufflepuff. I was going to say, he's so warm and open. He seems like a Hufflepuff. But then you said the thing about the Hufflepuffs. <laughs> Probably would be. I yeah. Like I think he's Definitely. a Hufflepuff. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think there's a lot about the implications of virality in the film as well. Obviously, um, they're all trying to get... There's different aspects of the film where vampires go viral and there's lots of different implications of that. And it sort of breaks down a lot of relationships. Um, and a lot of things change for different people in the film. I don't want to be too spoilery. <laughs> but obviously, Christian, with your background in Harry Potter, obviously, I don't know if you had any reflections on those kinds of implications of this big viral, like the virality theme in the movie, because of seeing so many people like in the limelight, and Naomi probably as well, seeing people um, being thrust into the limelight almost. Did you ever reflect on that as a theme? Um, that's interesting. I don't know that I thought about it in the context. I guess because for James, that's not um, that doesn't really come up for me in the story. But but I mean, in life, I think it's like a thing that mm -hmm. I've seen so many friends. I feel like I feel like um, getting instantly getting suddenly famous is probably one of the more uh, bizarre, like one of the most one one of the most emotionally difficult experiences I've seen people go through over and over and over. Um, mm -hmm just the intensity of it is it's like one of those things that that you know we're, we're a lot of people a lot of us are like fighting for and then I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy like the thing that I that I see people then go through is just it seems so it, it seems so difficult also it's like um it's, I mean, I know there are more difficult things in the world believe me I like I understand that like it's not on the scale of <laughs> one to ten not like the worst thing that can happen by any means but um but it is the it is a very strange thing to watch people be distorted by it i think or or feel the the, the like um distortion of it it's like such a and we and because of the speed at which people become recognized and then vanish again now it's like um you sort of see the same it used to be like it would happen to a few people a year and now you're seeing it, people like playing out this storyline over and over and over and over, you know, within minutes. Yeah, definitely. What about you, Naomi? Do you have any thoughts on that one? I mean, on in the movie. Yeah, well, I think within the context of the movie, um, so the, the other thing I, I do is uh, talk and, and write about the lack of women in film and the lack of non-straight, cis, able-bodied white men in film. Um, and I, I have a book coming out on February Fourth, uh, that about that, and I, um, I've I've just been in the final draft of that book, and so thinking something that comes up a lot within communities in terms of that virality is that now that like people are are starting to break through for the first time, that what tends to happen is that some one member of a community or a couple members of a community then get to make stuff. And the pressure on them to rep to properly represent the community becomes so intense that often the, their own community begins tearing them down actually because it because there's so much pressure and of course any community is incredibly diverse and no no one person can be the spokesperson for that so so the vampires in the film that's sort of the thing it's like like this dude's gonna go on a reality show and then everyone's going to assume all of these things about that because of, because he's the visible member. And um, it's really interesting within a movement to try to, to deal with that. For instance, Lena Dunham, who um, you know was one of the first women of our generation who actually got to make stuff. 
and you know, there's there's a lot of things about Lena Dunham that makes me wish she wasn't the spokesperson. She wasn't like the feminist spokesperson of our generation. But the things that have been written about her are more vitriolic and more and nastier than even were written about Harvey Weinstein, um, because which I think is is very bad. Like there's but there's that thing that because she was the person, then it just became like because she wasn't perfect. Um, there was just this like volume of anger and pain channeled at her that uh, was fairly damaging, I think. Does the book have a title, your book? It so does. You can... Do you want to know it? I love it. It's called the wrong. Kind of... <laughs> it's called the wrong kind of woman dismantling the gods of Hollywood. Oh, is that exclusive? I mean, like, as in, have you announced it already, or is that the first time? Um, well, it is available on Amazon pre-order, but I think this is the first time I've said it in an interview. <gasps> yes! Breaking <laughs> news! Right, so it's out February 4th, right? February 4th, nice. yeah. Nice. Ooh. Well, thank you. The last question, I guess, is what advice would you both give to anybody looking to break into film as actors, writers, you know, anyone looking to break into this? Um, and maybe do it in a bit of a different way. Maybe look at it in the way that Naomi's looking at it, I guess. Um, God, I would feel so unqualified right now because I think, um, I feel like things have changed so much since I started. Uh, I don't know how, I don't know how you start other than it seems to me from, from talking and looking at people that making, create that, that sort of uh, taking Taking creative responsibility seems to be a big, a big aspect of how people break in. But um, I don't know. I feel like uh, I just feel deeply unqualified to answer that. I guess is that um, because the old, the old like uh, get an agent method is. I mean, I still think that's probably a fairly healthy way as an actor, if you can, of um, like getting representation. Sort of. Uh, for the sort of actor that I, I mean, there are also so many different sorts of, of pe there are different kinds of people going into acting, but for me, it's always been like a, um, it's been always been a vocation and like a lifelong pursuit, regardless of what happens. And so, um, so like representation was the thing for me because, um, because I feel like working within a, a system. But uh, I know for a lot of people, like, there's people coming more from like the personality end or using it as a way to to be seen in order to then do other things. Um, there's like lots of different ways in. There's probably no right way, but um, I'd say yes to things maybe is probably a good, a good thing. But I feel like- Naomi, Would you say yes if they said, come back as Tom Riddle? <laughs> well, of course I'd do that. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> good to hear. <laughs> Like I asked that to everyone. <laughs> no, I feel so uh, connected to that role, and also that experience has been such a has informed my life subsequently so much that, um, uh, of course. But um, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, I would say say yes to things probably. Hmm. I feel like that's good life advice as well. Just advice yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I guess. I sort of come from the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of generally wanting to blow up the system. Uh, mm. So, I mean, I, I just think, I think the advice I would give is, is, is figure out what your true north is. This is kind of what Christian was saying is like, there, there are a lot of different reasons to get into this business. There are a lot of different things that people want. And I think what tends to happen is that people get told what the correct path is like you do this and then you do this and then you do this. And actually that's, that's a correct path to only a very specific outcome um, that may or may not occur even if you take those steps. So I think um, like, like to me, telling stories has always been the most important thing and getting to interact with audiences who, uh, who are impacted by those stories. And so like my whole career has been sort of like trying to, to do that <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. like when I was an actress, I was getting, I was sort of getting, when I was just j quote unquote, just an actress, I was sort of getting to do that, but, it, but I wasn't getting to tell stories that I cared about. 
or play roles that I felt were representative of the women that I knew in the world. Um, and so then I was like, okay, well then I'll just write. The problem must just be that nobody's writing them. I'll write them. And so then I wrote them and then it was like, okay, well then I have to make those movies. And then, and then, uh, then I realized that there was this sort of chronic systemic lack of women in film. So then it was like, okay, well then we better fix that. And then how do you get around the system? If the system won't let you in, how do you get around the system and tell those stories anyway? And then now I'm trying to figure out how do you get them to audiences? <laughs> but I think, but, but, but by following that true north, although it's not been an easy path, I do think that my level of fulfillment is so high because, I'm, because everything I'm doing is in pursuit of that thing that makes me feel okay. Um, and I, and mm. I see colleagues who, who lose that true north just become so deeply miserable. And I think that that happens to a lot of people in the industry because they're sort of like chasing goals that they are told they're supposed to have, but maybe don't actually care about. Um, so I think figure out what you care about and then find a way to do that no matter what. That's really great advice. Yeah. yeah I, I, I love I, that. I want, to, I want to add one thing to that also, which is, um, which is, uh, which it just it, it reminded me that also like, um, I would say, uh, find the people who are excited by the same things you're excited by and collaborate with them because uh, it's not a competition. There is no lack. There's no like other people's success is not, um, doesn't mean anything about you. And like the, um, it doesn't prevent you succeeding. And, uh, and that those sorts of like, so many things just happen by chance in terms of being around people. And so like, if it's at college or uh, drama school or in theater bars or, uh, you know, get talking to people and find out like what excites them. And then when you meet people who uh, you want to collaborate with, um, collaboration is incredibly hard, but it's also, it's also at the heart of like, film and theater is that these are not solo activities that they're, they really involve a community of people working together and, um you know i have to say one of the most one of the things that over the last 10 years uh that has been the most fulfilling thing that i've done is that i just randomly fell into directing my one of my closest friends comedy shows and um you know i spent 10 years working with him as those have grown and it's been something i was never looking to do it just sort of came from conversations we had and um you know those like strange things will appear and change have appeared and changed what i'm interested in and what i work on and so i would say welcome like welcome that stuff in if you can yeah also that's great advice <laughs> so yeah i think that's everything from me but do you want to tell everyone where the movie is available Naomi, maybe? oh yeah you know i do um okay so if you <laughs> If you go to bitemethefilm.com, you'll find all of the information you need. Um, if you're in the UK, you can't find us on tour because we are, we cannot get the RV over there, but uh, you can watch it, I think, on Amazon and a really wonderful independent platform called Seed and Spark, um, which is sort of like Netflix for indie films. It's a subscription service, but it's pay what you can. So you can pay as little as $3 a month and get access to their content. It's the only streaming site with 50% content by female creators. And um, because they really care about independent filmmakers, we actually make five times as much money when someone watches it on there as on iTunes, Amazon, or Google Play. So if you can, do watch it on Seed and Spark. Um, and, you should, and also follow along our docu-series if you're interested. Um, it's, Kiwi is doing such an incredible job. They're so funny and so fun um, and informational. So you can find those on YouTube. Just search for Bite Me the Film or the Joyful Vampire Tour of America. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I absolutely love the film and definitely recommend it. Um, I'm going to play the little trailer after this. But yeah, thank you both so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> My name is Sarah Woods. I belong to the House of Twilight. <laughs> we are a collective of independent vampires. I'm sorry, what? We're not supernatural. Obviously. We have been under investigation by the IRS and we have just received a ruling that we are not a legitimate church. Independent vampires. Can you tell me what that is? We need to feed on energy to stay healthy. And how? We drink blood. Ooh. Who are you? My job is really boring. <laughs> Ulysses is my favorite book. 
I like The Bachelor, it's my favorite TV show. You're kind of a weirdo. Many real vampires hide their darker natures from people at their jobs. What is your job? I'm a kindergarten teacher. Of course you are. I thought that maybe you liked me, which was stupid, obviously. I do, I do like you. No, you don't. That first night, it was so real. It was like I knew something about you, about us. I only just met you. I know, I wasn't gonna say anything because I didn't want to sound like some lunatic stalker person. You know what, I don't care. I want to be your lunatic stalker person. You don't date for eight years. We have to go. And now, you're making eyes at that guy? <sighs> Is there a woman in your bedroom? We had sex, do you know how much trouble I could get into? You have no idea what it is like to have people stare at me from the second I leave my house. Maybe they're staring at you because you are yelling in the middle of the sidewalk. Hello. You think that this isn't gonna go the same way it always goes? No, I don't. You make me want everything I thought I was better than. Sarah! So you want to go out with me, but I have to be a secret? No, no, because you just, until your audio case is closed, you just... And after the audit's over? I only just met you. Wait, you're not gonna bite me, are you? We don't bite. It's not sanitary. That's right, then.